I'm Henriette van der Doet. I'm the current chair of the Surrey Scots Society. And I'm here to be the host. So I introduce you to Janet Morton, who is our education officer on the committee and who has organized this lovely event for all of us. It was great pleasure that we welcome you all and in particular Hazel to our first Zoom autumn talk. So thank you so much for your kind invitation, Janet, and to Henriette for your support. It's a real honour to be asked to give the Surrey Sculpture Society Autumn Lecture. So welcome to my life as a sculptor. So I see myself as part storyteller, part choreographer. And what I really want to do is to move people, so move them to tears, move them to take action, move them to ask questions. So here we have the first one. So where do your commissions come from? Well, it ranges from, we want you, Hazel, to do this sculpture for us, which is fabulous, of course, or to the other end, you have these really long, protracted, competitive processes, and I've experienced the whole range. So somebody's particularly interested in how I got my first commission, and this was Sadako Sasaki. And this came from a conversation. So I was at the Fulham Palace Art Fair, I had a stand with my portraits and talking about commissions, and along came Jill, and told me her vision for her peace garden in Wales. And she told me the story of Sadako Sasaki, who was a young girl who died from the impacts of the Hiroshima bomb. But there's a whole peace story around it that her and her family and friends made, had to make a thousand paper cranes in order for her to, to live. Sadly, she died, but her story has been taken up in peace education across the world. So that's one sort of direct um, approach from a conversation. The St Nigel Gresley Commission, how did I get that? Well, that was recommendation. So somebody in the Gresley Society knew an artist who knew an artist who knew somehow along that line knew me. And so it was one of these expanding briefs. So first of all, the phone call was, would you be interested in making a bust of Sir Nigel. So the designer of the amazing Mallard and Flying Scotsman and said, yes, of course, that'd be really interesting to do. Next phone call was, so what if we had a life-size figure? How much would that cost? And then the next phone call was, what if we made it, you know, maybe 20, 30% larger than life? And so for that, it, from recommendation, and it wasn't a competitive process, I ended up making Sir Nigel Gresley for King's Cross. So then we have the next one, which is a different process again. So from the Royal Society of Sculptors, we have an email newsletter, and it mentioned this artist call to create something to celebrate the lives of the women factory workers in Carlisle, the cracker packers. And I looked at that and I thought, this is for me. How rare is it to see working women celebrated anywhere, let alone in, in bronze? So it was a competitive process and I won that, uh, that bid. And finally, we come to the Emmeline Pankhurst process. Now, somebody asked, do you use social media and do you ever get any business from social media? And the answer is, well, with the Emmeline one, that's how I found out about the call for artists. It was a late one night and I was on Twitter and I heard mention or saw mention of the commission and I followed the lead on the project, Andrew Simcock, and he direct messaged me and said, would you like to be considered for this? And it was like, of course, I would love to be considered for it. So I spent many years working internationally on women's rights. I become a figurative sculptor in between. And so bringing those two passions together was for me absolutely um, perfect. And it was a, sort of a very long process. We had a, a long list, a short list. We were sent off with 5,000 pounds to bring back a maquette and then these were unveiled and we were shown over in London and in Manchester. And finally, I won the vote 
of the public and also the unanimous choice of the selection panel. Phew. Okay, so next, sort of relating to this, is how do you get your design ideas? And it's pretty much about immersion. So really understanding the subject and starting to sort of choreograph the story that I want to tell. So I'll give you two examples. So this is the Cracker Packers. It started with being in the archives, reading Hunter Davis's book, The Biscuit Girls. But the real joy was to actually engage with the Cracker Packers themselves. And we held this, what in essence was really a storytelling workshop. And they designed the statue for me. So they not only helped design the, the pose, so two women cracker packers, one from the past, one from the present, sort of telling, telling stories over time. They also helped decide what they'll be wearing. And so from that workshop and the laughter that we had it was extraordinary. I don't think I've laughed so much ever. So it was this camaraderie that really helped shape um, what we were doing. So that was a, a real joy. With the Emmeline Pankhurst project, so again, it's immersion, reading Emmeline's autobiography, finding images of her and other suffragettes, as you see in full flow there. Working with the model, I was working with amazing Sarah Jenkins, and then starting to realise in pen drawings and sketches and then rough maquettes, sort of what my ideas would be. What's the story I'm trying to tell? So I picked a time, 1908, 1909. It was a pivotal time for the suffragette movement. And it was a case of you know, repeated political betrayal. They were absolutely incensed. You know, enough is enough. Time for deeds, not words. So here we have suffragettes on the streets, ringing bells, summoning people from their homes and from their offices. Somebody grabs a kitchen chair and up climbs a five foot Emmeline and addresses the crowd, mouth open, urging women to rise up and demand the vote. So that was a story I wanted to tell. What I would say that was fascinating about Emmeline Pankhurst was I was trying to get the photos of her and put them in a timeline so I could understand the aging process. And because I chose about 1908, 1909, she was 50, she'd been on hunger strike, she needed to show her age. And I had a whole discussion with Helen Pankhurst about it. And we didn't want her to be um, airbrushed, we wanted her to show her age and the, the, the politics that had wore her over the time. So, how do you go from the idea to then, you've got this maquette, you've visualised it in 3D, and how do you make it large? I want to do it the old-fashioned way, build a size on an armature, the metal frame, work with the model in the studio, build it to size in clay, then comes in the foundry. So this was a little maquette for the Cracker Packers. After the workshop, I came back, absorbed the ideas, and worked with my models, my sisters in fact, and then took this up to Carlisle and thankfully they loved it. And if you can see, they're standing on a ginormous Carl's Table Water biscuit. So that adds part of the fun and I really want people to love them and be part of the, the community um, and sort of treasured, which they, they, they do seem to be. So here we have the Emily Maquette that won me the job. And in terms of the actual scaling, I basically take the maquette that I've worked on and then work out how many times the size of that do I need to multiply up. So Emmeline was around, the large one was about 5.672 times larger. And so literally you just measure everything and scale it up to size. And likewise with Sir Nigel, or the albeit with his mallard duck missing from his side, he was about 5.6 times the size of the, the small maquette. And obviously the important part of that is how do you make the armature. If you wonder what an armature is, it's how you keep half a tonne of clay from falling to the ground in a heap. 
So you really have to engineer it. And I work with the sculptor Mark Longworth, who I've known for a long time. He's a fantastic sculptor, also works at the foundry. And so he comes to the studio and we work together. I do this, sort of the sizing and the scaling up and he works on sort of bolting it together. So we have a back iron and that takes the weight, that takes the half a tonne of clay with very little pressure being on the actual the feet. On the right hand side, you see a starting key clamp, but it's literally scaffolding. And you put in joints, you know, you can see the elbow joints, the knee joint, and you put this all together and then you build a sort of a structure on top of that. So this is incredibly strong. When sculptors get together, we often talk about the armature disasters that we've had. And with commissions, you don't have time for it to go wrong. So if anything, I over-engineer the armature. So here I am padding out with polystyrene, the chest, so it just keeps it a little bit lighter. Wrapping round armature wire, just is something the clay can key onto. And you also might see there's some hanging down, the little sort of wooden crosses, and they're called butterflies. And these are incredibly traditional from, you know, over 100 years ago, you can see them being used and just help support the clay. And even down to creating little cages, as you see here, there's a foot armature, which becomes even more elaborate than that, and the head armature. So even though I've done a lot of work on this head armature, when I put the clay on and got the draft, should we say, head of Sir Nigel in clay on it, I realised that when I scaled it up from the maquette, the head just looked too large. So I did have to take the head off rather precariously, take the clay off, cut down the armature, make it a bit smaller and then put it back on top. So this is one of my um, disasters. But sculpting is basically problem solving. So it's always the things you know, that you need to do to get yourself nearer to your end goal. So just a quick look, the cracker packers, you can see these are quite small figures. They're more like sort of five foot tall, but I have still got quite a lot of detail there, very much driven by the, the shape and form and the dimensions of the maquette. And likewise, dear Emmeline, there she is. And to get that arm out, to make sure that wasn't going to fall down with the clay on top, and you remember, it's not just the clay, you've got the rubber and then the resin on top. And the, that needs to hold all that weight and that arm cannot move. So that involved bending steel across the, uh, the torso as well and across down the, the arm. So another question is about why do I always work with a model? Well, for one thing, oh, it gets quite lonely in the studio. So it's always, models are always very entertaining and good uh, and good and have lots of fun with them. But also, if you want your piece, to, you know, if you want to breathe life into your statue, if you want some anatomical integrity, then you have to work with the model as far as I'm concerned. So here is good old Barry McGuire. And just as Rodan did, I work with the, the nude figure first, and then I sculpt the clothing on. So you'll see here the stages across gradually sculpting the clothing on. So just to explain that, that if you think, if you look down at yourself now and you look at your clothing, at your arms and your legs, how much of your clothing is actually touching your body? So pretty much all of it, unless you're wearing a long skirt. So that's why you need the anatomy in the body first, and then it's easy to just sort of sculpt the clothing on, on top. And then it does have that degree of life to it. So here are the cracker packers in progress. The corset is really important to shaping the whole figure. And I was lucky enough working with my models here, my two sisters on the left, Sada, my artist sister on my right, Jenny, my younger sister. And it was you know, such good fun to work. You can see on the left hand side, Jane lent me the white coat um, that McVitie's um, cracker packers currently wear. There's jeans, there's sort of steel-toed boots, and of course the hairnet. And we've got the Cracker Packer from 1910. And costume is just one of the other things to work on. Rosie Talbot worked with me. She looked at the archive photos from McVitie's cars and helped design this costume for the Cracker Packers from around 1910. So in terms of the fabric, 
it's really much about the form. So it's usually about the pleats and the shadows that fall rather than the surface texture, which gives you the, the effect. So every little pleat you have to, have to sculpt. And Emmeline very much, again, working from the body and then layering the clothes on top, but with a great attention to the corset that Emmeline would have been wearing. And it was a delight to work with the wonderful Sarah Jenkins. And Rosie once more helped design the outfit. So Rosie took one look at my baquette and said, you do realise that Emily would never have been able to take that jacket off because I'd forgotten to leave any fastenings or any slits on the sleeve. So that was something I hadn't even thought about. So as you can see, Emmeline ended up with her outfit with a little slit there. Um, and I know poor Sarah, we were finishing this in a really hot August and she was wearing the full outfit. She was wearing corset, full dress and jacket. And for those um, armature nerds that wanted to know a bit more about armatures, this is an EXO armature. So this is for the skirt. There's just so much clay in that skirt. So I had to build an armature around and hanging down. And those skirts, I can tell you, they take forever. And I hadn't even thought at the early stages that I would really need a strong armature for the hat as well. So again, the hat has to take the weight of the clay, but also the rubber and the resin on top. And uh, it took us a couple of days to actually build that armature to get it, get it right. You know, now we're back at the, the last stages of that, uh, the last night, all the little creases in the back of the jacket are there. And here she is the final morning. I'd been up all night, my sister had put camp beds out, ready for us to have a little nap, but no, I carried on just fiddling and fiddling. I mean, nobody else would have noticed the difference, but I kept on going until finally the client arrived and the foundry, and I literally had to almost be dragged off of her. And so that's part of the obsession of working. So another question that somebody was asking was about how do you publicize your work and i guess i see myself more as a communicator i love to share with people my work in progress so how i work and i also love to learn from other people and so for me i do use rather erratically but i use social media so twitter and instagram and and facebook but i guess where the publicity comes for my work tends to be the commissions as you can imagine so you think about the unveilings these are the big media splash things so the Emmeline Pankhurst 7,000 people in St Peter's Square for the unveiling in the end of 2018 I and myself and Helen Pankhurst the great granddaughter we were leading 1,000 school children into the centre of Manchester and well the, I say we led the idea was that we were going to lead them but we were soon overtaken by this sort of surge of young kids shouting out, you know, what do we want? Equality. When do we want it now? And it was just such a, you know, an inspirational moment when they all surged forward. So that was a real sort of blanket coverage in the national news. With the uh, Sir Nigel Gresley unveiling, that was, you know, there's a real media scrum there as well. But that was as much about the fact that Sir Nigel didn't actually have his duck in the end by his side. And there'd be a big campaign in the newspapers about he should have his duck, he shouldn't have his duck. So uh, lots of photos of people with their plastic yellow ducks and their wooden ducks, you know, protesting. And sometimes you have just opportunities around um, the commission. So I think the largest crowd I've talked to was 50,000 people at half time at Manchester City game, um, talking about the Emily Pankhurst project uh, and the TV news on top of that. But there's other things that come across, opportunities like to be interviewed by Sally Lindsay, the actor, for the documentary The Making of a Militant, which was just you know, a wonderful piece of, of documentary making. And then there's the random things. There's the, you know, 
Sir Nigel on have I got news for you and there's the three questions on University Challenge. This is on the scout to Hazel Reeves. Really quite a bizarre thing to, to happen and I knew nothing about it beforehand and you know other opportunities like Radio 3 asking me to come and talk about my favourite woman composer. So you know you get these wonderful uh, opportunities that, that, that come up through those commissions. But what I love is how people interact with the sculptures afterwards. You, you spend your time, you start off with ideas on the back of an envelope for your statue, and then you find it, it's there, it's in bronze, and people love it, and they dress it up. So with Emmeline, you can see there a couple of pictures from the 16 days of activism uh, against violence against women, and she was being dressed up to highlight different occupations and jobs that women have and to try and get employers to pledge to support women employees facing domestic abuse. You have Emmeline dressed in full PPE, Extinction Rebellion again have her in a flotation vest, sometimes she's there with flowers, sometimes people have left chocolates for her. I mean it's just such a rewarding thing to see. And, and you have lots of connections with fantastic charities. So all these women's organisations from Manchester, like Safe Spots, Pankhurst Trust, um, Breakthrough UK, Women's Asylum Seekers, together. And I've been able to raise money through selling maquettes. And um, yes, yeah, so lots of wonderful opportunities and including a highlight, which was at the Charleston Festival being um, interviewed by the head of Tate, Maria Belshaw. So, um, lots of wonderful things that just come up. I don't, you know, proactively seek these things, but it's a real joy. So we come to how do I divide my time between commissions and my own work? So I don't really see them as separate. So the commissions are my opportunity to express myself artistically and politically often. And so I see them as my work and just an element of my work. But it does involve a lot of juggling and it depends on deadlines. So, you know, if I'm full on in the studio doing something, then I can only focus on that. But then I might have to step outside of that for a week and teach. You know, so it's about having to project plan. So having a background originally in business <laughs> does sort of help me do that sort of project, project planning. Others have asked questions about me and whether I tell my own stories through my work or how much of me is in my work and that I think links to sort of the the other things that I that I do and I think it's taken me many years to realize that basically it's all about me um, I never thought of it but it's only in the last sort of couple of years I realized that whatever I do is something it comes from from me and it could be quite directly so here we have, for example, Mummy's self-portrait with my mum's portrait inside. And that I did in the weeks after my mum had died. So that's something very sort of personal for me. But I draw on my other obsessions. So dance, working with dancers has been a real joy. I just love to work with dancers. And we choreograph literally together in the, in the studio. And I didn't want to do that little pretty ballerina type sculpture. I wanted it all to be about the movement and the dynamism. And so to stop me doing something too fiddly in clay, I started to experiment with using wax sheets that you can get from Tarantes and using it a bit like clay, warming it up and then putting on light clay. And so I can't do the detail. And so the focus is then on the movement rather than the little face or the sort of the features or the, um, you know, the hands. But however much you try and breathe life into your pieces, whether it's a piece of public art or whether it's a dance piece, in essence, bronze is static. And that led me to thinking, okay, well, that's frustrating. And then out came the megalomaniac in me, which was, okay, why don't I have a group of dancers that are my modeling material? And why don't I use 
unusual, weird soundscapes to manipulate their movement into these amazing sort of human murmurings almost. Remember like those starlings doing their murmuring. And so out came the project I've been working on and uh, about to start more work on that's uh, an, a, a sculptural approach to expressive movement and dance. And this would be somebody was interested in um, how this would be documented. And so it's by working with a filmmaker, Roshian, it's working with guest artists, Helen Goodwin and Olga Saavedras. And one's a photographer, one's a performance drawer. And obviously it will be a performance in its own right as well. This isn't yet happening. We're adapting how we're going to work this. And it is quite ex exciting for me to be doing this. So in between time, I got a grant from the Arts Council, England, and to work on building these soundscapes and getting the equipment to do the recording. And so some of you have asked about my Nightingale Diaries, which have been online. So I don't think any of my friends would have believed that I could ever get up at 2 a.m. in the morning and record <laughs> the dawn chorus. But I've, I've managed it. and It's just such a joy to do. And I was really delighted to have that featured on Sounds of Earth on BBC Three uh, very recently. And this comes back again to me because, you know, why am I obsessed by recording birdsong? Well, I was brought up in a home where my mum ran a bird hospital and a bird sanctuary. So again, it all comes back to me. So this gives you sort of an idea of some of the other things that um, I've been doing alongside teaching and working with a new Art Junction team that we're starting an online Art Junction school very soon. This is the question that kids often ask, you know, how do you turn the clay into bronze? So here you've got Emmeline and the foundry team. So they're putting on the first stages of rubber. They've got a very liquid layer on first. Her hands are being moulded separately because they're a little bit more of a complex form. Then the thicker layer. And now they're dividing out the mould with little uh, walls that you can see. Even more rubber going on there. C incredibly heavy, all of this. And they're putting a hard jacket on the top. So painting that on in resin. So you can see they've got their respirators on. Dagmar and Teresa have finally finished. Hurrah! And then we come to the next stage. So the mould is taken to the foundry and into that mould they paint and they pour wax. And it's propped up so there's no movement in the wax. Because you imagine if it's warm in the foundry you can have a bit of movement. So you need to keep your eye on it and it's called the lost wax process because this will disappear what is wax will become bronze itself i mean i love being at the foundry i work with bronze age sculpture casting foundry in limehouse and i work with them for an, a number of years and i trust them i know when things go wrong that they will be able to put them right so I worked for many hours, for example, on the Emmeline piece. It's a, such a large piece. I worked alongside Mark Longworth, who was also working on her. But it's my responsibility to keep that, the integrity of my clay, right throughout this process until literally I install Emmeline in St. Peter's Square. It's my responsibility. So the foundry is quite an invasive process. There's lots of opportunities for things to be slightly out of kilter or to go wrong. Um, and I have to, to be the one that, that keeps an eye on it. It's sort of almost a quality uh, control, I suppose. And with Emmeline, it took probably a couple of weeks to get it right. I mean, for her, we were creating a chair, her on a chair, and it all had to be reinforced. So at the wax stage, even, we were putting in extra sections of wax to reinforce the chair she was standing on, to reinforce her outstretched arm to make sure that I think the structural engineers had to engineer so that two heavy people hanging off her arm wouldn't be a problem. And if there were high winds coming from one direction, there wouldn't be a problem. The wax is then in, encased in ceramic shell, as you can see here. And this will go in a kiln and the wax will basically be heated out, will drip out. And the molten bronze will go 
in there and will replace where that wax was. The Emmeline Pankhurst pool, we had the press association there, we had the BBC here, we had the documentary filmmakers there. It was a real scrum, they're all competing to get the view of the foundry because it is like being back in the industrial revolution times. The smell of it, the heat of it is really evocative. So the molten metal is being poured into that ceramic shell, it's replaced the wax and then it will be knocked out or jet sprayed out. Anything that's happened in the bronze that I really need working on, then I go around with a, you know, with a, a sharpie pen and sort of draw circles around it and basically work with the metal workers very closely. Once the metal is ready, then we have the patination process, basically the colouring process, and you use heat and you use chemicals to create the colour. Emmeline took a lot of skill to get her to the colour that she is, not too dark. So I went into career in business, followed by um, a career in international development, focusing on women's, women's rights. And I started to get back into art um, from a period with the, the UN and the Dominican Republic, which really sort of got me back in touch with the things I loved in life, which was dancing and music and drumming and art and, and so on. So when I came back, I got into sculpting. So they went along side by side for a, for a, for a number of years. And so it was organisations like the Society of Women Artists that I first started to exhibit with, getting in touch with other artists for the first time. And then the Surrey Sculpture Society was the first society that I then started exhibiting at, you know, Wisley and you know, Landmark and, and other places. And so it was from, from those early stages that I started to build my, build my networks and with places that I've taught as well. So my colleagues at the, sorry, the Sussex Sculpture Studios, where I had a studio for um, a number of years and kept close with, with them. And, um, and it's quite a small world of figurative artists. So there's people I'm um, still in touch with from when I was learning at different points. So whether it's the Florence Academy of Art or Heatherly School of Art, like Mark Longworth, and my contacts through the, the, the foundry. So in terms of you know, networks, they just slowly, slowly began to connect up with other sculptors. And I think, I love sculptors. I think um, we're a different type of people. We're quite visceral as well. And I think we're, uh, we'd love to get together and chat, chat, chat. Um, so it's been a real joy when I do get a chance to meet up with other sculptors. Thank you very much, Henriette, for managing the meeting. And huge, huge thanks to Hazel. You can see your meticulous preparation in your sculptures you've put into the talk as well. And uh, you mentioned that camaraderie shaped your sculptures, but it certainly has shaped your talk and thank you so much for answering the question so fully and in an interesting way. I'm sure that we should all <laughs> like to express our appreciation to you for a really wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a real, real pleasure. And thank you so much for all sort of letting me into your homes tonight. <laughs>